So last time, we began our discussion of Tana Merriweather, a scheming personality who lied at Tyrion's trial and who later masterfully worked her way into Cersei's good graces. And we also discussed House Merriweather, a house on strategic lands whose previous lord may have been a secret Rhaegar supporter and who shared similar experiences with John Connington, such as a handship, an exile, and a stripping of lands. And we pointed out that Tana Merriweather seems to know too much. She knows exactly how to speak with Cersei Lannister, and she appears to have known about the golden coin found in Rugen the Jailer's cell, displaying coordination with whoever planted that coin. And while the coin incident appears to point to Tana working with either Kyburn or Varys, more evidence is certainly needed to figure out which one and exactly what she wants. And so let's move on to Cersei's small council chapter, a chapter that involves Tana's husband Orton Merriweather in hopes that we can examine his attempts at political sway and figure out who would benefit. Now, Cersei's small council is supposed to be a group of individuals loyal to Cersei and House Lannister, though the only characters who appear to be loyal are Pycelle, Giles Rosby, and Harry Swift. Pycelle generally gives the best advice on how to govern a kingdom, and Giles Rosby appears competent, though not too engaged outside of his specialty of the treasury. Harry Swift comes off as not too bright and a sycophant. As it happens, Pycelle's sound advice is an excellent point of reference as we can identify the chaos makers and their desires in their opposition to Pycelle. For example, while Pycelle feels a royal navy would be costly, a rain waters pushes for one still. And we know how that turns out. Waters steals the navy for his own personal gain. Looking back on this chapter, what Waters wanted is glaring. And so we have three chaos makers on the small council besides Cersei herself. There's Arrayne Waters, Kyburn, and Orton Merriweather, who each seem to guide Cersei away from sound decisions to folly. Now, depending how you count, the small council covers 11 issues in their meeting in Cersei 4, though some of the issues are obviously connected. The issues are Dorne, the New High Septon, the Vale, the Royal Fleet, the Ironborn, the Iron Bank, the Freys, the Golden Company, the North, the Night's Watch, and Dragons. So, on issue number one, Dorne, Horton Merriweather is completely silent. Dorne Martell wants justice, and Cersei is sending the Mountain Skull, supposedly. There's nothing we can say about Merriweather from this. Issue number two is the new High Septon. Pycelle says it will be Septon Olador, who is in fact the leading choice, but Kyburn thinks it will be Lucian Frey, the second most popular. And then Merriweather seems to get into some sort of small argument with Pycelle over the issue, though in the end, Merriweather agrees with Cersei that one High Septon is no different from another, an incorrect position. Though Merriweather may have just been being conciliatory towards Cersei. As we don't know what Merriweather and Pycelle were arguing about, there isn't much to work with for getting in Merriweather's head. Now, it's issue three where things get interesting. The Veil. The Knights Declarant say they're going to forcibly remove Littlefinger as Lord Protector of the Vale, and Cersei is undecided if the Crown should intervene. Now, Pycelle's position is that the Crown should intervene to prevent war, however, Orton Merriweather pushes no action, and claims that Littlefinger is not a warfighter, and he would be removed with no bloodshed. Besides, he claims, who rules the Vale is irrelevant. Cersei agrees, seemingly wanting to have Littlefinger back as Master of Coin, and chooses to do little other than tell the Lord's Declarant not to harm Littlefinger. Now, Cersei's move of no action is in opposition to not just Pycelle, but her own father. In A Storm of Swords, Tywin has his own small council meeting, and the Vale was an issue there as well. Littlefinger was sent to marry Lysa and return the Vale to the King's peace. Furthermore, Littlefinger was to raise Sweet Robin to be loyal to the Crown. And Littlefinger is specifically said to be preferable to the alternative suitors for Lysa, namely Bronzion Royce, who Kevin Lannister calls a dangerous man. Now, yes, Littlefinger actually has his own plans, and Sweet Robin is certainly being raised with no love for Tommen. But Cersei doesn't know any of this. Littlefinger is publicly a Lannister man. Yet, based on Merryweather's advice, Cersei decides that it's completely fine if Littlefinger is removed, the man who, again, is publicly loyal to the Lannisters and is the very mechanism for making the Vale loyal to the Crown. And on top of this, Littlefinger would almost certainly be replaced as Lord Protector by Bronze Jan Royce, 
considered a dangerous man by the Lannisters. And so, Meriwether appears to make a move to hinder Cersei and Tommen's rule over the Vale by promoting a do-nothing position. However, harming Lannister rule is hardly a surprise here. We already knew that the Meriwethers were hostile based on Tana's manipulation of Cersei. No, what is surprising is that we actually have seen this political position before. During Tywin's small council meeting, there were also characters oddly pushing to do nothing over the Vale. There is Lysa Arryn to deal with, John Arryn's widow, Hoster Tully's daughter, Catelyn Stark's sister, whose husband was conspiring with Stannis Baratheon at the time of his death. Oh, said Mace Tyrell cheerfully, women have no stomach for war. Let her be, I say. She's not like to trouble us. I agree, said Redwine. The Lady Lysa took no part in the fighting, nor has she committed any overt acts of treason. Tyrion stirred. She did throw me in a cell and put me on trial for my life, he pointed out with a certain amount of rancor. Nor has she returned to King's Landing to swear fealty to Joff as she was commanded. My lords, grant me the men, and I will sort out Lysa Arryn. And so Tywin and Tyrion certainly make good points. Lysa's husband, John Arryn, was for Stannis. Lysa's sister is Catelyn, the mother of Robb Stark, who the Lannisters are at war with at this moment in time. Lysa's house, House Tully, her brother, Edmure, her uncle, the Blackfish, all fight for Robb. Not to mention Lysa did show aggression towards Tyrion and failed to swear fealty to Joffrey. All things considered, a do-nothing position as Mace Tyrell and Paxter Redwine have put forward is pretty ridiculous. From the Crown's perspective, something must be done about Lysa Arryn. So Mace Tyrell and Paxter Redwine weirdly gave some bad advice that was remarkably similar to Orton Merriweather's bad advice. Odd, but perhaps it's a coincidence. And this brings us to issues 4 and 5 the Royal Fleet, and the Ironborn. So, Arrain Waters attempts to bring up issue 4, building a royal fleet, before being interrupted by Orton Merriweather with issue number 5, and this odd exchange. Merriweather nodded. Strength at sea is most essential. Could we make use of the Iron Men? asked Orton Merriweather. The enemy of our enemy? What would the Sea Stone Chair want of us as the price of an alliance? They want the North, Grand Maester Pycelle said which our queen's noble father promised to House Bolton. How inconvenient, said Merriweather. Still, the north is large, the lands could be divided. It need not be a permanent arrangement. Bolton might consent so long as we assure him that our strength will be his once Stannis is destroyed. And so Merriweather presents a very convoluted proposal. He wants an alliance with the Ironborn based on the idea that an enemy of an enemy can be a friend. Now, this actually doesn't make any sense. The common enemy of the Ironborn and the Lannisters was Robb Stark, who is now defeated, and Stannis has not yet attacked the Ironborn at Deepwood Mott, so he's not their enemy yet. The Ironborn and the Crown share no common enemy. In fact, the Boltons are currently assaulting Moat Kaelin, making the Ironborn and the Crown enemies. Also, sharing lands in the North temporarily as a solution? Not only does this make little sense in the Autumn, but does anyone think that the Boltons would accept giving up lands to the Ironborn? Or that the Ironborn would pack up and leave later, even if they did? It's certainly not a great proposal. Not to mention, having the Ironborn as allies is hardly a mechanism for defeating Stannis. Stannis is at Castle Black, which can't be reached by sea, and Storm's End is unassailable by sea. The Ironborn would only be useful in taking Dragonstone from Stannis, which at the moment is already being dealt with by Paxter Redwine's fleet. And so the Ironborn would only be a supplement to Redwine forces on Dragonstone. So what the hell is Orton Merriweather even talking about? Why is he pushing for a temporary alliance with the Ironborn? This scene is more than a bit perplexing, but one thing that shines some light on it is that it's not the first time that a ridiculous alliance with the Ironborn has been proposed. Again, back at Tywin's small council, we have this exchange. Sir Kevin Lannister cleared his throat. As regards to the Starks, Balon Greyjoy, who now styles himself King of the Isles and the North, has written to us offering terms of alliance. He ought to be offering fealty, snapped Cersei. By what right does he call himself king? By right of conquest, Lord Tywin said. King Balon has strangler's fingers around the neck. Robb Stark's heirs are dead. Winterfell has fallen, and the Iron Men hold Moat Caelan, Deepwood Mott, and most of the Stony Shore. King Balon's longships command the Sunset Sea, 
and are well placed to menace Lannisport, Fair Isle, and even Highgarden, should we provoke him. And if we accept this alliance, inquired Lord Mathis Rowan, what terms does he propose? That we recognize his kingship and grant him everything north of the neck, Lord Redwine laughed. What is there north of the neck that any sane man would want? If Greyjoy will trade swords and sails for stone and snow, I say do it, and count ourselves lucky. Truly, agreed Mace Tyrell. That's what I would do. Let King Balon finish the Northmen whilst we finish Stannis. So Paxter Redwine and Mace Tyrell think an alliance with the Ironborn is a good thing. Tywin changes the subject, though it's Paxter Redwine who brings the issue up again. Lord Redwine pinched at his nose. May we return to the matter of the Greyjoy alliance? In my view, there is much to be said for it. Greyjoy's longships will augment my own fleet and give us sufficient strength at sea to assault Dragonstone and end Stannis Baratheon's pretensions. King Balon's longships are occupied for the nonce, Lord Tywin said politely. As are we. Greyjoy demands half the kingdom at the price of alliance. But what will he do to earn it? Fight the Starks? He is doing that already. Why should we pay for what he has given us for free? So notice that the logic of the alliance actually shifts. Mace Tyrell thinks that the Ironborn will fight in the north while the Crown fights Stannis in the south. But now Paxter Redwine wants something very different. He wants the Ironborn to augment his fleet to assault Dragonstone. An Ironborn supplement of the Redwine fleet. The precise thing that Orton Merriweather is asking for. We know who benefits from Orton Merriweather's proposal for an alliance. Paxter Redwine. He specifically would gain forces to help him on Dragonstone. Paxter said as much in A Storm of Swords. What we don't know is why Orton Merriweather is trying to help Paxter Redwine, or why this is the second time he has mimicked Paxter Redwine's views. Whatever the case, the Ironborn Alliance is rejected by Cersei, and the discussion moves back to the Royal Fleet, and then to a discussion of issue number six, the Crown's Debt and the Iron Bank. Pycelle and Giles Rosby point out that they don't have the money for ships because of expenses, which includes debt payments to the Iron Bank. And although Pycelle protests vehemently, Cersei decides to delay payment to the Iron Bank, a horrible decision as we know that this leads to the Iron Bank supporting other claimants. And despite this being a really stupid move, Orton Merriweather gives his support, calling the move wise. Another sign that he does not support the Lannister cause. After this, the small council moves on to issue 7, the phrase. Kyburn suggests executing Freys as punishment for the Red Wedding, a move that would obviously destroy the Frey-Lannister alliance. So Cersei decides to put the idea on hold until Walder Frey dies. Now notably, the entire small council, presumably including Meriwether, looks at Kyburn with uncertainty when he brings up the Red Wedding. And although Meriwether doesn't speak during this topic, he certainly doesn't show any support for Kyburn either, showing that he's not lockstep with him. It's also interesting that he doesn't support the move, even though it would certainly hurt the Lannister cause. Perhaps he believes execution is too extreme, or he wants to protect the Freys. And then we get to issue number eight, the Golden Company. Now here, Arrain Waters mentions that the Golden Company has broken its contract with Mir and is on the march, perhaps fighting for Stannis. Meriwether mocks this idea, saying that Stannis has no gold to hire them, and they are called the Golden Company. Cersei then says that Kyburn reports that they are marching east to Volantis, not west, and Meriwether says that they grow weary of fighting for the losing side, that is, for Stannis. Now, I will say that Meriwether's joke is completely nonsensical. He claims that Stannis cannot afford the Golden Company, but then suggests that they are marching away from Westeros because they're weary of fighting for the losing side, that is, for Stannis, who can't afford them. It's also very interesting that Meriwether downplays the threat of the Golden Company considerably. He falsely claims that the company is named for their desire for gold, when in fact they are named because their word is as good as gold. Of course, the genesis of their true name highlights how odd it is that they broke their contract with Mir. And even if they were named for their materialism, the situation is still perplexing as, according to Ariana Martel, they are passing up good wages and good plunder by breaking their contract. On top of all of this, Meriwether downplays the threat of invasion by suggesting that the company's march east is a sign of war wariness when it's anything but. 
Overall, Meriwether's actions suggest that he's gunning for the success of the Golden Company. After this, discussions move on to issue number 9, the North. Now, the talk on the North begins with a discussion of Stannis using wildlings, which prompts Meriwether to say that Stannis is a desperate man. The discussion meanders a bit, but eventually comes to news of how Davos has been captured by Wyman Manderley, and Cersei wants to know what to do with him. Meriwether then suggests that Davos be sent to King's Landing to be questioned, as he might know much of value. Kyburn then says that Davos should be executed. Now again, we see that Kyburn and Meriwether are in disagreement, showing a lack of coordination. But also, it's striking that Orton again speaks in contradictions. He claims that Stannis is a desperate man, yet for some reason he thinks that Davos would have valuable intelligence. I cannot think of too much helpful information that Davos could provide, and apparently neither could anyone else on the small council. But also, why does one need information for a war that, according to Meriwether, is pretty much won? Now, it should be noted that had Davos been sent to King's Landing, he would have ended up in the Black Cells, which are accessible by Varys, who is presumably still hiding in the Red Keep. It's also worth noting that Davos would be a somewhat valuable hostage for the Golden Company, as the Golden Company plans on landing on Cape Wrath, where Davos's lands are. So the next issue is issue 10, the Night's Watch, who are reportedly helping Stannis, which outrages Meriwether, though he has no input on the remedy. It's Kyburn who suggests that they send men to the Wall to murder Jon Snow. And the final issue is dragons, brought up by Arrayne Waters, though no one else on the small council has any input on them. And so, overall, we see that Orton Merriweather is fairly active on the issues of the Vale, the Ironborn, the Iron Bank, the Golden Company, and the North. He wants to do nothing in the Vale, allowing the removal of Littlefinger, a Lannister man, wants to form a temporary alliance with the Ironborn, which would aid Pexter Redwine in taking Dragonstone, he wants to delay payment to the Iron Bank, which would cause the Iron Bank to support a different claimant, he downplays the threat of the Golden Company, and he wants Davos sent to King's Landing. He is mostly silent on other issues, though his lack of support on executing Freys and executing Davos shows that he's not coordinating with Kyburn. Now, it seems rather clear that Meriwether's actions do not fit with someone with Lannister interests in mind. Why push away the Veil, vale, alienate the Iron Bank, and downplay the Golden Company, if not to undermine the Lannisters? And yet, at the same time, Meriwether passes up on other opportunities to ruin the kingdom. Why not support the execution of Freys to destroy their alliance, or beggar the kingdom on building ships? The answer that seems to fit best is that Orton Meriwether is a supporter of the Aegon cause. The house history seems to support it, the golden coin seems to support it, and the other causes have been eliminated. Without Littlefinger, the Vale forces would likely remain neutral during the Aegon invasion. Delaying debt payments would cause the Iron Bank to seek other claimants, perhaps Aegon. The threat of the Golden Company is downplayed to help the element of surprise for them. Davos is requested for King's Landing so that he would fall into the hands of Varys. But Rainwater's royal fleet wasn't supported to allow for an easier invasion, and perhaps the Freys are not to be executed as there's a chance to sway them to Aegon's side. The one action that remains perplexing is the Greyjoy Alliance. We have an apparent attempt to support Paxter Redwine's siege on Dragonstone. However, there's no clear reason for this. What do the Red Wines have to do with anything? What is rather striking about this is that when Cersei leaves the small council meeting, she finds Taina joking about the Red Wine twins, claiming that they're in love with Marjorie. What is it you all find so amusing? The Red Wine twins, said Taina. Both of them have fallen in love with Lady Marjorie. They used to fight over which would be the next Lord of the Arbor. Now both of them want to join the Kingsguard, just to be near the Little Queen. Now, Taina's information appears to be false. Osney Kettleblack later reports that knights are coming around to flirt with Marjorie's cousins, not Marjorie herself, who is married. So what's Taina's game? Why lie about the Redwine twins? And this is done just after Orton Merriweather's proposal of a Greyjoy alliance. Well, next time we will address the mysterious Red Wines and how they fit into all of this. And you know what? We're going to talk about Blackfire Rebellions. Yeah, that's right. We're going there. We will see you all in part three. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.